So um, thanks a lot for inviting me to share with you some of what we've been doing. Um, how we can enable synchronous collaborative learning tools with operational transforms and ShareDB. And just to give you a little context, uh, I'm working on a platform called Frog with um, basically we want to enable rich configurable learning tools. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff we do too, but I'm going to focus on the individual tools and how they support um, synchronous collaboration. So just to give a, a brief kind of uh, overview of what this could look like, let's say that we had a um, script for a class where we had uh, students uh, doing a quick quiz, uh, teacher debriefing, uh, students doing some work individually uh, in green, and then the teacher again doing maybe some debriefing, and then we might form pairs of students. Um, students see the learning challenges that they entered individually, and then they start discussing with each other and match the learning technologies to learning solutions, the teacher debriefs. So this is a typical kind of script that we could do in Frog. In this case, it was in a physical classroom, but it could also be in a fully online classroom. And the way we do it in Frog is that we have um, this graph with these three lines. And the first line from the bottom is individual activities. So we ask them first individually to answer a quiz about how they learn. The middle line is a group activities. And so here you see at the towards the end there's a chat and then they discuss a learning solution. And the top line is a whole class activities. So for example, the debrief with the teacher will be a whole class activity. And what we do in Frog as well is that we um, have this concept of data flow between different activities. Um, for example, at the beginning there, you see that the answers that the students provide in the individual activity flow into the debrief um, to be shown. And the little round uh, things you see there are operators that work on the data, um, aggregate, disaggregate, distribute, translate to Spanish, automatic grading, and so on. So we're not going to go too much in, more into detail on that, but what we're going to zoom in on is these individual white boxes, which are um, the tools, and we're going to look at how we implement that and how they're all actually backed by um, collaborative editing and shared DB. So we have a lot of different, we call them activity types, you could call them widgets or tools. So we have a lot of those in Frog. And part of the reason is that Frog is a research platform and we're interested, so oftentimes we build new uh, tools for very specific experiments. Like we have here a melting chocolate simulation, which is not something you would use very often. Uh, we have a train ticket buying simulator, which is also very specific, but we used it in a, a class on interface design. So a big part of our um, goals with designing Frog was to make it as easy as possible to build new kinds of tools on top of the platform. Because it's the goal was to have not only our lab, but also other labs be able to very quickly experiment with very rich uh, collaborative activity types. So that kind of um, guided us in how we designed our APIs. So when we talk about collaborative learning, one of the first things that comes to my mind is collaborative editing. And you all know Google Docs, you probably are familiar with Etherpad. And I've used Etherpad a lot in my own teaching and some of my experimentation. Um, but you know, in Frog, we don't want just to have the kind of standard Etherpad um, experience, but we might want students to be able to watch a video together and take notes collaboratively. Um, we might want them to do some programming in Python, run some automated tests, and again, that should be synchronous collaboration. But even something like this, where you have a gallery of physics images and you want the students to write a caption together, it should be possible for that text field there to be collaboratively editable. And this wasn't really possible with um, putting Etherpad everywhere. So we were looking at other solutions. So the, the main, th so there's two approaches to collaborative editing that are fairly well known. The first one and the one that came first is called operational transforms. There is a new approach called CRDT, um, which I'm not going to talk about today, but if anyone has heard about that and have questions afterwards, we can um, discuss. I'm not an expert, but I know a little bit about the trade-offs. So there's all kinds of complicated graphs like this when you look into the literature on operational transforms. Um, but I find some really nice slides I'm borrowing here from Joseph Gentle. 
uh, who is one of the core programmers of ShareDB, but he was also on the original Google Wave team. So I'm going to use these slides instead. Um, now, imagine that um, you're editing a document and you have Anne and Beth, and Anne, she wants to insert cat, so she inserts C-A-T, and Beth, at the same time, let's say that they do this very quickly and there's some delay, and so practically at exactly the same time, Beth inserts dog, right? And we would like to preserve their intention, and so we would like the final document to have the text cat dog. However, if these individual inserts, uh, you know, come kind of interleaved like this, what we might end up with is something else because the C is gonna get inserted and then if you try to insert the D at position 11, the underlying document has now changed and so um, the D is not going to go in the place that you thought it would and so on and so on, right? So even this extremely simple example of two people typing three letters um, can end up quite, quite problematic. And this is already assuming that we actually atomize each operation and submit them like this. Because the even simpler assumption that you might make is to say, every time that someone updates the document, I'm going to write the whole document to the database. And in that case, we wouldn't even see cat and god. We would actually see one of their changes completely overwriting the other ones, right? So this is a problem. Um, what we need to do is to transform the incoming operations so that we first apply the first one, insert C, and then we see that there's a new operation coming in, insert D, that was uh, performed on the original version. And we know that the original version is not valid yet, so we need to transform this operation, operational transforms. Um, so we go here from position 11 to position 12, and now this works out perfectly. And we can even uh, optimize this by saying, you know, if we moved these inserts um, previously and we moved these other inserts down, um, then it, it all uh, makes sense. So what we need is a function that can transform uh, these operations um, so that they um, preserve the, in the intent of the authors. Now, initially, operational transforms were developed for text editing. There's actually, this is a great example of kind of really interesting computer science research going back a long time, uh, being applied to um, something, you know, products that we use every single day, because there's really interesting papers on this kind of computer science theory. And I'm happy to share some links with you guys afterwards if you want to dig into it. Uh, so it started with pure text, and eventually people said, you know, we want rich text, we want XML. Uh, we want tree structures and so on. And so in ShareDB, you can have more complex things. So let's say that you had an array with the letter C-A-T, but now they're individual array elements. You have some numbers and D-O-G. And in this case, um, you know, if, if uh, Anne says, I want to move item one to the last position, and Beth says, I want to replace item one with E, then when we preserve this, basically we say, well, Beth now wants to replace the last item with E, right? So it's exactly the same pro principle of looking at the version that an operation is applied to, and if it's not the current version, we need to transform that incoming operation. Is that kind of clear so far? Just shout up if it's not. Um, so there's a bunch of different specific De and the, the devil's always in the details. So there's a lot of different um, algorithms, although the most widely used ones seem to be the one that come out of the Google Wave, Google Docs, Etherpad kind of um, group of uh, projects because uh, Google Wave um, was a, a very early um, example of this kind of algorithm and it was eventually open sourced after um, Google decided not to continue the development. And Etherpad, um, was an early project that implemented collaborative editing and it was also open sourced when it was bought. Um, so based on these ideas and um, uh, built by Joseph Gentle, who was one of the early Google Wave engineers and some others, uh, ShareDB is one of the only really uh, mature open source frameworks for doing uh, very flexible operational transforms. 
Uh, it's on GitHub, you can see here, it has support not just for text, but also for JSON and for rich text. And it's been under development for, I think, since 2011. Um, currently, it's not under very rapid development, but it's very stable. There's a number of companies that use it. And it was dormant for, for a number of years. Um, but recently, there was a company that kind of made a friendly fork because they had a, a number of small changes they wanted to make. And um, they were able to actually bring that back. And now there's a few more uh, contributors and there are some more activity. But the thing is, these are the things they're doing are very small because this is something that seems to be extremely stable and um, very functional. So let me go through a few key concepts in how ShareDB uh, is organized. So the first concept is a connection. Right now, ShareDB is JavaScript. It can run both um, on Node on the server and in the browser. So in Node, you can connect. Uh, you can set up a connection, and uh, there's actually a number of different database adapters. But we use Mongo, which seems to be the most commonly used. Um, if you only have a single uh, Node connection to uh, ShareDB, then that's all you need. But if you have multiple ShareDB servers that all want to talk to each other. They also use Redis as a message queue. Um, so you set up a connection to Redis as well. And then you can also um, ask the ShareDB library to start listening to incoming WebSocket requests. And then, of course, on the client, uh, you would um, connect to one of these node servers that are listening to incoming requests. So um, basically, within so once you're connected, we have uh, collections, and these are very much like Mongo collections. And in fact, they are represented by um, collections on the Mongo side. Um, so, what you, so what can you do with a collection? Uh, well, you can create one. It, um, you can search uh, for documents. And you can either do a one-time search or you can subscribe to a search. And this is where you can use the full Mongo query language. So you can say, I want to subscribe to all new documents that has this metadata. And then when someone adds a document somewhere, it'll just you know, pop up with a, with a callback. Um, so you can fetch existing documents, um, and you can create new documents. And talking about documents, sorry, oh, fun, documents disappeared. So uh, actually, that should be documents on the top right there. So for documents, you can create them. You can subscribe to, the, to changes. You can submit ops. So these are the kind of operations that you would submit, like insert a character or delete uh, an item in an object. And you can also get snapshot, which is um, I want to get a historical version of a document. And there's some, some other utility functions. But the main thing you do with the documents, you create it, you subscribe to it, you modify it. And a really important concept here is operational transform types. Because uh, the key is what are the different operations that you can do to a document? And how are they um, able to transform those operations in a meaningful way? And right now, there is support for text, which was the original one, rich text, which is basically text with formatting, so you know, uh, bold, italic, and so on, um, and JSON. And the JSON is super powerful because it can contain other OT types as leaves. So you could have an object where there's a key called text colon, and you know, then there's a string, but that string can be treated as an OT text, so you can have collaborative editing on it. But then there could be another uh, string called, you know, rich text. Sorry, another key called rich text colon, and the the value of that would be a rich text, and you would use the rich text um, OT OT uh, operations on it. And this makes it very very flexible for our purposes, which I'll show you. So, how do we use ShareDB in Frog? As I said, our goal was to come up with the the best developer, developer experience. You know, we wanted to make it as possible, as easy as possible for people to make new tools or new widgets um, that supported very flexible data types, data representations, and synchronous collaboration. So we have this concept of social planes. And I showed you that on the graph, right? So we have individual group or whole class. And what happens is that every time there is an individual activity, we um, we create one ShareDB document for each student because it's individual, so each so they don't share data. For group activities, we create one ShareDB document for each group, 
And for whole class activities, there's a single document for the whole class. So in this sense, the activity doesn't really have to care about what social plane or who are the group members, right? They just get access to a document and they modify that document. Um, we have a, a class called generate reactive FN and we, in, we initialize this with a sharedDB document and it basically provides wrappers for all of the sharedDB operations. So rather than uh, handwriting submit op and then you have to remember the op type and this and that, it kind of provides functions like insert object, append to list, and then we can also type check that the parameters are the correct ones. And we've, we've wrapped this, um, we pass this to, to the React components as data fn, uh, data functions, as you'll see very shortly. And then we have um, a higher order component, which is a React component that outputs another React component. So basically every activity type is represented by a React component, and we wrap it in Reactive Hawk. So it takes a document ID, it subscribes to it on ShareDB, it calls generate Reactive FN, which we just talked about, and then it renders the React child, which will be the actual activity type, with uh, the two uh, props data, which is the, con the contents of the ShareDB document, and of course, it gets then re-rendered every time the, the contents change and data fn, which are these wrapped functions um, that I just talked about. And so the activity types are standalone NPM packages, uh, confirming to a specific, so we use flow types, so we have a flow type definition for the API. And there's two key files that they export. They have an index.js that has some metadata and declares the config function. And they have activity runner, which is this key React component. And uh, I realize that I'm, I'm probably moving quite quickly, but I'm now going to kind of go through all of these things in detail with um, the AC simple chat, which uh, some of you might have looked at. Um, here's a quick demo how this looks in our, so we have a preview in Frog where we can easily play around with the different activity types. And here on the left, you see the configuration. And on the right, you see a single student using this. So, it has um, a collaboratively editable mood, which I just put there because I wanted something that was collaboratively editable. And it has a, a chat functionality. And the first thing we can see is that as we update the config on the left, uh, it, re it um, updates live so that we can see um, what's the effect of changing the config. And then we can add another student. And we can see that the first field is collaboratively editable. The second field is a normal text field, but when we enter, it inserts a chat message. So it, it doesn't look good because I was trying to do something absolutely minimal uh, to kind of highlight uh, this core functionality. So uh, in, our, in our repo, we have these, um, these activity types, and we have there the AC simple chat with the um, uh, files that we're talking about. So, as I said, there's an index.js, and um, it has some metadata. So it has the name and the description of the activity. And that is what causes the activity type to be rendered like this in the um, activity type selector. So it kind of auto detects which um, packages are available, and it um, just renders the activity selector based on that metadata. Then uh, we use... Um, JSON schema to specify the config. So we just, it's a declarative um, way of defining the config and we render that in the way that you see here. Um, and then we store that, you know, whatever has been entered into that form and we pass it to the activity runner when the activity is ready to be run. And this is a key thing. This is the data structure. And this is the empty data structure that we use to initialize the ShareDB document. So for each student or for each group or for the whole class, we will create documents that um, are of type JSON, and in this case has a string, a mood string, and an array of chats. So what happens when we, on the server backend, initialize this activity is that for each um, for each instance, right, so for each student or each group, um, 
we run the create operation. And in Mongo, there are two different collections. There's RZ, well, RZ is actually our name, so it could be any name, right? But RZ and O dash O underscore RZ. So RZ keeps each document and the current, so some metadata, as you see, some when it was created and so on, and the current content of that activity type, uh, or sorry, of that document, right? So right now you see mood is a string, it's empty, chats is an array, has zero elements. And O underscore RZ keeps every single operation. So there will be many uh, documents here for each document in RZ. And in this case, there's um, an operation of type create, and then the data is what you see below. But as we start editing this, there will be um, different kinds of operations. So that was the index, and now the server has initialized the sharedb document, and we're ready to load the React component. So the React component in Activity Runner, um, it takes in activity data, data, data fn, and user info. And what happens when this activity loads, this is from the WebSocket interface. Um, initially, it says, I'm going to subscribe. I'm going to just connect to this WebSocket. And so the first line is just the WebSocket saying, yep, I'm shared to be, I'm ready. And then the green line is this thing saying, I want to subscribe to this specific document. And this is just the ID of the activity type, of the activity, and then all, because this is a whole class activity. And then the response, the third line, is the initial data, so mood and chats, of this, um, of this document. And if we look at the props in the React Developer Tool, we see that we have the config, so show mood and the title. And we have the data, which is coming from the sharedb. And we have the data fn, which are the functions to modify the data. So as you remember, we declared what kind of config we want. Then the user types in the answers to that, those config questions. And then that config data gets passed into the React component. And here we can use that data. Um, first, we use config.title to, to show the title. And then we have a conditional where we say, if, there, if the user said that we want to show the mood, then I'm going to show the mood. right? And here you see um, the reactive text. So this is a helper component that we have. Um, we pass it the data fn and the path, uh, which is mood, and it will, it will put up a text input and it will attach it to um, the, the mood path in our data structure so that any updates from the server will automatically be um, updated in the text input and any user updates will be sent to the server. So this is how this would look. Right, you see from the config, I have the title. Um, now, if the user typed happy, for example, then the user would create a, a number of updates on the uh, WebSockets. And below, you see the definition of this um, uh, up from the sharedb documentation. So, uh, I mean, this is quite hard to read, but basically, you specify a path. And in this path, the first step is mood. And then the second is the position in the text document. And the, and the up is si, so insert text. And here we insert h-a-p-p-y. And once we've done that, we see on the top right that the mood has now updated to happy. Right? The second step is the chat. So here we map over chats in the data on the second line from the top there. And then we just render the chat messages. And then we have a text input, which when you submit something, we use data fn .list append, And the first part of that is the object that we're inserting that has, uh, we're writing which user sent it, what's the message, and we just generate a random uh, ID. And the second chats 
is the path in the in the data object where we want to put this. So here's the chat um, part of the component. And if I type in something here, like, hi, how are you? That's now not generating any um, updates because it's not that text field is not collaboratively editable. But when I press Enter, it generates this green line. And because it's you can't see all, I, I pasted it in below. So here you see that uh, the path P is chats 9999. That's just because I'm inserting it at the end of an array. And Li means insert in array. And there you just see the object I'm inserting. And after that has been processed by the server, we see that the data on the top right has changed. Now we have the mood still, but now the chats has a, as a, a single item, which is the object that we just created. And of course, the React component re-renders and we see the chat message. So what you're seeing on the left there is the entire, um, act, the, the entire code of this um, activity that enables both chatting and uh, collaborative editing. So that was a very simple activity type. And of course, we have a lot of activity types that are a little bit more complex. So I'm just going to give you a very quick demo of our rich text editor and show some of the things that we can do with that. So with Frog, we also have um, operators that can get content from the internet. So in this case, I um, retrieved a bunch of uh, hypothesis annotations that students have been doing. So you see on the right there. So these are two students now. And on the right, they have a gallery with different um, annotations. On the left, they have a rich text collaborative editor. Uh, you see that um, it, it assigns different colors to different students, just like um, uh, Etherpad. We can have different formatting and so on. But we can also actually drag in some of these um, rich pieces of content um, into the document. We can copy it and paste it down here. I can delete it. And we also have access to a bunch of built-in um, rich content items, like, for example, collaboratively editable spreadsheet. So again, everything that you see right now is happening through ShareDB. So you see here that this is collaboratively editable as well. And while the students are working on this task, the teacher has access to a dashboard, which is live updated, where the teacher can not only see the current state of the document, but we also have the full history. So we can go back and forth in the history. And finally, as you saw, we captured the full history of all the ShareDB documents just because of how ShareDB does its work. And we've been doing some research in our lab um, to look at whether we can actually understand things about um, who is um, taking different roles, how the students are, what writing strategies the students are taking. So we have some tools here that take the basically the log messages from ShareDB and try to reconstitute um, the, the actual actions that students took. Uh, we've been looking at the paragraph similarity over time, uh, looking at whether um, two authors over time having more semantic similarity or more semantic uh, difference is a predictor of collaboration. Uh, so this is early work, but it is the kind of thing that is enabled because we are doing this kind of uh, collaborative editing internally in Frog. So I think I'll end there, and I'm happy to discuss any questions you have.